Welcome to Microbiology. We're going to be looking at chapter one here, which is going to give us an overview of the microbial world and you. We want to look at some terms. These terms include things like microbes. Microbes are also known as microorganisms, and they're also termed a lot of times as germs. Now these do include things like viruses, bacteria, protozoa, and yeast. Now, when we're looking at viruses, bacteria, protozoa, and yeast, viruses are not really classified as microorganisms because they're not a living organism. Okay, they're considered what we would call acellular. They don't have a cell, but they do get kind of uh, clumped in here with microbiology because, because they are small. Now, I do have a question for you. Are all germs bad or are all microbes bad? If we're talking about viruses, bacteria, protozoa, yeast, are they all bad? Well, the answer to this is actually no. Most of the time we hear about viruses, bacteria, things like that, and we automatically think of them being bad. Those are the ones that we consider to be what we call pathogenic. Pathogenic are the disease causing microbes. And in reality, guys, most of the microbes that are out there in the world are not pathogenic. Majority of the microbes out there are actually beneficial to us or they don't care or harm us at all. Now, how do we name a lot of these microorganisms that we're gonna talk about? Well, this brings us to what we call nomenclature. Nomenclature is the naming and classifying of living microorganisms. So this does exclude viruses because viruses are non-living. When we look at this nomenclature, we see that there's eight basic taxons. And if you've taken a general biology course, you have covered these taxons. Okay, it starts with the broadest or biggest taxon, which is the domain. It then moves down to kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and then finally species. You do need to know these in order. One way to know these in order is going to be using some sort of mnemonic to help you. Put together kind of a sentence that gives you like that first level of each of these groups. So I have an example here. It says domineering King Philip came over for good soup. If you notice, all of the capital letters, first letters of the word correspond. So do domineering is domain, king is kingdom, Philip is phylum, and so on. Come up with your own. Come up with one that's going to relate to you. There's lots of different ones out there. You can, you can look them up, that sort of thing. Now, who came up with this whole idea of a nomenclature? Well, Linnaeus kind of gets the credit for this because he's the one that really focused in on what we call a binomial nomenclature, which we use today. This uses Latin as its language to assign organisms a two-part name. This is why the binomial comes in because it gives them a two-part species name. The species name or scientific name is going to be composed of the genus plus a specific epithet. Now the genus you'll notice is the group right above species here and the specific epithet is normally something that describes that particular organism. So this is that two name system. We also see that they use Latin because Latin is considered a dead language. It's not changing. So this allows us to use it and it be standardized around the world. So here's an example. An example here is Staphylococcus auroris. You'll notice anytime we write this binomial name for a species, you're either going to underline it because you can't italicize when you're actually handwriting. Um, but if you're on the computer, you're going to italicize these. That's really important. You're going to also notice that the genus is capitalized. The genus here is the Staphylococcus. This genus tells you that this means clustered spheres. That's what Staphylococcus actually means. The specific epithet here, where we talk about auroras, means golden. This refers to the color that the colonies make when they're on a culture. Okay, so Staphylococcus auroris gives us an idea of what we're looking at. This is going to be the same whether you're talking about staph here in the United States versus if you're talking about it in Germany, Japan, Australia. This is going to be that scientific name that's going to be the same and standardized all over the world. This can be abbreviated. The way we abbreviate this is we would take the first letter of the genus. It is still capitalized and it'll have a period and then you would have the specific, specific epithet follow it. A concept you need to understand, guys, is this idea of taxonomy and naming and organizing and classifying organisms is ever changing. Okay, used to we had the topmost part of the taxonomy was kingdom. But we've actually seen that it's moved up to using three domains. These domains are based on cell type. So we have bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. So the focal points we're going to look at are going to be highlighted here, and bacteria is one of them for microbiology. 
Now, bacteria and archaea are going to have what we call prokaryotic cells. This means these cells are not going to contain a nucleus and they're not going to contain those membrane bound organelles. Now, eukarya obviously has the eukaryotic cells, which are the cells that have the actual nucleus and organelles. Now, there are four basic kingdoms that fall underneath these domains, and these include protista, fungi, plants, and animals, or what we would also say plantae and animalia. We will see that some of the stuff we talk about in microbe may be in the protista kingdom, others would be in the fungi, and then some would also be in the animal kingdom. There are no plants we're going to discuss here in this microbiology course. Now, do remember that these are going to be part of that domain eukarya. They do have eukaryotic cells, the protista, fungi, and animal. So cells. Cells are membrane bound and they do contain DNA. Now, this DNA can either be housed in a nucleus, which is going to be a bound structure, or in an area called the nucleoid. Now, the cell types, we just talked about this on this previous slide where we had prokaryotic and eukaryotic. So based on what we talked about, which of these cells, A or B, would be prokaryotic and which one would be eukaryotic? Well, if we really take a look at this and we see that there are no organelles and no nucleus in A, A is going to be the prokaryotic cell. This is going to be the cells that are found in the domain bacteria and archaea. On the other hand, B is going to be a eukaryotic cell, and you can see that there's a lot more structures present. These structures are those organelles, those little organs, and those are going to be the kingdoms protista, fungi, and animalia that we're going to talk about in micro. Some organization are going to be unicellular. Una means one. This means it's going to have one cell making up the organism. We also see that some organisms are going to be multicellular, meaning multiple cells make up that organism. So if we take a look here at this kind of flow chart, we see that the unicellular organisms are going to be organisms that contain a single cell. These are going to be things like amoebas, that's part of the protozoa kingdom, bacteria, and paramecians. They are a single-celled organism. On the other hand, multicell organisms are going to be things like plants and animals, and though in this course we'll focus more on the animal kingdom. So bacteria and the majority of protista, which are a big part of microbiology, are going to be unicellular organisms. Fungi, though, kind of has a divide. Fungi, you're going to find some of them are unicellular and some fungi are multicellular. Now, another thing we need to look at when we're looking at organisms is how do they acquire their nutrients? How do they get their nutrition? Now, some of these are going to be what we call autotrophs and others are going to be heterotrophs. Now, autotrophs guys are self feeders. They're the ones that can do some sort of process that allows them to make their own food. Normally, we think of this process as photosynthesis, like plants. Plants are going to use sunlight. They're going to take in that sunlight. They're going to then convert it into sugar that they can use to grow. We can't do that. When you're hungry, you don't go outside into the sun and be like, man, that was a great meal I had. You don't have the ability to do photosynthesis. You have to consume your food. That means you are what we call a heterotroph. So on the autotroph side, we see these are going to be organisms that produce their own food or from organic molecules. A lot of them may do a photosynthesis type of um, conversion where they're going to use sunlight in order to do this. This is like green plants, phytoplankton, algae, and cyanobacteria. On the other hand, there are some organisms that are going to be what we call chemoautotrophs, which means that they're going to utilize chemicals to rearrange them and create their own food. This is going to be really important for organisms that are in the deep sea, okay, chemosynthetic bacteria around like those volcanic vents deep in the ocean because no sunlight penetrates there. On the other hand, when we talk about heterotrophs, these are the consumers. They're going to actually consume their own food. Okay, they're going to eat it in some type of way. And these are organisms which have to get their energy from other living organisms. These producers are important because they are going to be the ones who are going to put those nutrients and, and those sugars and those sort of things into the food chain from the use of the sunlight or other chemicals. So they're going to have a big ecological importance. We do see that heterotrophs are going to also have some ecological importance if they are decomposers, meaning that they're going to consume and recycle dead material. Some of these heterotrophs are also going to be medically significant because those are the ones that make us sick. Those are the pathogenic types of microorganisms that are actually feeding on our cells and they make us sick.
but majority of these are going to be beneficial okay most of these types of microorganisms whether they're going to be autotrophs or heterotrophs are going to be beneficial to us they're not going to be the, they're not going to be pathogenic all right so if you've printed off the little notes that came with this you'll see that there are there's a little chart in there and it's talking about types of microorganisms and we're going to talk about viruses first now if you look here with viruses it does have a little asterisk or star next to it this is going to tell you that some of these viruses are pathogenic meaning and they do cause illness or disease. Now, in this chart, it has cell type. Remember that viruses do not have a cell type because they do not have their own cells. So their organization is going to be acellular. They're outside of the cells, and they're going to have a very simple kind of structure to them. Okay, They're not a cell because they lack a plasma membrane, and they lack cytoplasm. However, they do contain DNA or RNA, which you can see here in the picture. Okay, and since they do not contain that plasma membrane, that cytoplasm, those sort of things, they do not meet all the criteria to be defined as a living thing. So this is why we say that they are acellular. Now, when we look at this for nutrition, viruses are going to be obligate intracellular parasites. So think about this. When you are obligated to do something, it means you have to do it. So when we look here, viruses have to get inside of a cell. That's where the intracellular comes in. They have to get inside of a cell. Once they get inside the cell, they're a parasite. They are going to cause that cell now to make more viruses. They hijack it. They take it over. And that cell now will make more viruses instead of doing its normal job. When we look at viruses, they are particles that are made out of a nucleic acid core. This core can be DNA or RNA. And this DNA and RNA is going to be protected by a protein coat. These protein coats have lots of different shapes to them, which you can see here in these pictures. We do see that viruses require a host cell to reproduce or replicate, and because they do not meet the criteria of a living thing, they are considered to be non-living. Moving on to bacteria, when we look here in the domain bacteria, some of these are going to be pathogenic, but Archaea, if you'll notice, does not have the little star next to it, and it will not have any pathogenic variation. The cell type for both bacteria and archaea are going to be prokaryote cells, meaning these are cells that lack a nucleus, they lack organelles. Their organization is going to be unicellular, a single-celled organism. We see that in bacteria, most of these are going to be heterotrophs. Okay, so most bacteria are going to have to consume their food, where in archaea, we do see a lot of them are going to be autotrophs. But the way they do this autotrophy, whether it's photosynthesis or chemosynthesis, chemo is going to vary. Now, with bacteria, there are some basic shapes that are important to know for bacteria. And these shapes are going to come back constantly throughout this course. We see that there is going to be the bacillus. The bacillus are rod-shaped structures. Cocci or coccus are going to be the circular shape. And then spiral, of course, has a spiral shape. They do have a cell wall. And a lot of times the cell wall for bacteria is going to be made out of peptioglycan. And the way bacteria is going to reproduce is through what we call binary fission. We're going to go from one bacteria cell to two. Now, this is not called mitosis. Mitosis goes from one cell to two, but the word mitosis actually means nucleus division. There's no nucleus in a bacteria because it's a prokaryotic cell, so this is binary fission. When we look at archaea, guys, archaea are going to be biochemically and structurally different from bacteria. They used to be in the same group together. This was known as Monera. They're not in that same group because we found that they are a lot different from each other, so they separated them into these two domains. These archaea bacteria are going to thrive in extreme environments like bottom of volcanoes, inside geysers, bottom of the ocean, that kind of stuff. A lot of times they are going to be these extremes like thermophiles. They love high heat. They might be haliophiles where they love high salt contents. We also see that there's a group that are called the methanogens. They are going to create a lot of times methane gas. And guys, with archaea, these are non-pathogenic. Okay? None of these are going to be where they make us sick or cause disease. The next group we want to look at are the protista. Now, with protista, we do see that there are two kind of subgroups here. There's the protozoa and the algae. In protozoa, some of them are going to be pathogenic. 
The cell type, remember these are eukaryotic cells. They are eukaryotes, which means they do contain a nucleus and organelles. They're going to be mostly unicellular. So most of these protozoa or algae are going to be unicellular in structure. Their nutrition, this is where it gets a little different. Protozoas are going to be heterotrophic. Algae, on the other hand, are going to be autotrophic. And protozoa guys, they can move. These are the animal-like protista. They are going to be able to move, and they may move by a number of means. One is through what we call a pseudopod. A pseudopod is a false Foot. And this is what you see up at this top picture. This false foot is going to extend forward and it's going to pull itself forward on a surface. Flagella, on the other hand, is the tail. It's a tail-like structure that's going to allow it to move back and forth and allow the protozoa to move. Cilia are going to be in this far picture and those are those hair-like extensions. Okay? They whip back and forth very quickly and again it allows it to move through fluid across that surface. Algae, on the other hand, because they do photosynthesis, they are going to a lot of times contain some sort of type of chlorophyll that allows them to make their own food through photosynthesis. And with algae, there are some exceptions with this organization. There are some multicellular forms. When we talk about seaweed or kelp, that is a type of algae. It's not a plant. Okay, and so those are multicellular forms of algae. The next group we want to talk about are the fungi. When we look at the fungi, we do see that some of them are also pathogenic. They are going to be eukaryotes for their cell type. Their organization is mostly multicellular. We also see their nutrition. They're heterotrophs. Now, they don't eat and consume their food like we do, though. Okay, we actually have to ingest it, take it in, chew it up, and then digestion takes place inside of our bodies. Fungus is going to digest its food outside of the body. Okay, so when we have fungus, you'll notice when it starts growing on a substance, it's going to liquefy that substance and it's going to absorb its nutrients. Hey, this is why when you have fungus growing on something in your fridge or on your counter, like some sort of food, it starts to get all mushy and liquidy. It's because that's how it's going to consume the food and that's how it's going to bring it in and use those nutrients. We do see that molds are a multicellular form of a fungus. However, yeast is a unicellular form of fungus. All right, so we do see that they contain both types of organization, but molds are multicellular, yeast is unicellular. The last group we want to talk about here is Animalia. So with Animalia, we see, of course, the cell types are eukaryotes. And specifically in Animalia that we're going to talk about with microbiology are what we call the helminths. These are the worms. Okay, so it's a specific group in Animalia that are going to be targeted and looked at in microbiology. They are eukaryotic cells. They do have a multicellular organization to them. Their nutrition is heterotroph. They're going to consume their food. Now, they do contain microscopic forms at some stage during their life cycle. So even though you can actually see some of these with the naked eye, there is going to be a microscopic form in its life cycle somewhere. Some examples of these are your flatworms. These are in the group platyminthes. You can see that here in the middle picture. It's like a tapeworm. We did also see the roundworms, which are in the group nematoda. These again are going to have a microscopic stage, which you can see over here, which are like the ova or egg form, and those are going to be microscopic.